His lecture today, The Cosmic Origins of Civilization, Humanity Awakens to the ET Presence. Join me in welcoming Johnny Enoch. Hi, Victor. How you doing? <laughs> so, is everybody ready to go back into the past today so we can start looking at these mysteries from a larger perspective? Okay. So, some of you may have never heard of me before, and that's okay. I know Lenny over there put my name on the bathroom stall, called Johnny Enoch for a good disclosure. He's a very nice guy. <laughs> Uh, he also designed my slides today, he put these UFOs behind me, and uh, actually I drove one of them here today in the program we call them ARVs, Alien Replication Vehicles. Uh, you might recognize mine, it's parked downstairs next to the Tesla's charging. You can't miss it, it has one of the Lockheed Skunk Words bumper stickers on the back. <laughs> Oops, how do I get that to go back up? Oh, there we go, thanks guys. Aliens in the back doing it. Um, so, a little bit of an introduction about me. I guess uh, people always ask me, how did you get interested in this subject? What got you curious? Well, from a very early age, there were strange things going on around my house. And my sister, who's now in her 30s, and she has no interest in these subjects whatsoever. She's more interested in her Instagram feed and what the Kardashians are doing. Uh, <laughs> she has a memory that she can't shake from when she was just 12 years old of one of those gray extraterrestrials with the large hairless heads and the large teardrop eyes peering through her bedroom window. And this memory haunts her to this day. I think this thing just shut off on me again. Oh, there it goes back. Jeez, again, I tell you, ETs. Uh, anyhow, with this, uh, we had all kinds of these experiences happening around our house. My mother, who's reluctant to talk about these things, would tell us that both of us had been complaining when we were growing up of little gray men coming into our bedroom windows, which, uh, through our bedroom windows and into our room, which was very strange. That as kids, we were talking about this. Uh, and growing up, uh, she was very reluctant to talk about her own experiences. But I was having these strange out-of-body experiences myself, where sometimes I'd wake up floating above my bed, looking down at myself sleeping peacefully, and at other times I'd be waking up to this turbulent roller coaster-like experience of moving up towards these multifractal holographic colors and not really being able to explain it. And because I lived in a very religious house, there was an information embargo on these sort of things. So as I like to tell people when other boys my age were hiding playboys under the bed, I was hiding occult books and crystals under my bed. <laughs> if I wanted to see the playboys, I had to go to their house. Um, but anyhow, this, this uh, journey that I was on became a lifelong obsession. So I started to you know, look up you know, other modalities, things I could do to go deeper into this. I have a background in psychology and counseling. Uh, as well as working with clinical hypnotherapy to go deeper into the mind, to find out what our contactees are saying, what do these experiences reveal to us. Uh, then I started to realize that we had to look, go deeper and look in our ancient symbolism, our religions, go around the world and crawl underneath the crypts of temples and look at these great reliefs and immerse myself into the world of the occult. And what I found is that this has revealed fascinating information. Now, before we go any further, I want to dedicate today's presentation to all truth seekers, uh, including David Whitehead over there at the uh, wayofthetruthwarrior.com. He's a, a great truth seeker. Uh, but most certainly to all of you, uh, to the organizers that we have today and our wonderful, wonderful presenters who are all heroes of mine. Uh, but these two gentlemen have been incredibly inspirational to me. The uh, wonderful Lieutenant Colonel Wendell Stevens. And you can find his books in the back over there that have been brought here by the RVML Library, which is a wonderful, wonderful resource. I would strongly urge you to pick up as many of those as you possibly can. And of course, Sergeant Major Bob Dean, what a giant, a giant in disclosure, and a magnificent man indeed. This passageway has always haunted me. I do a lot of hiking here in our beautiful British Columbia. And as I hike, I often bring the works of John Muir with me. Uh, the great naturalist. He wrote, the clearest way into the universe is through a forest wilderness. So for years and years, I would think, what does he mean by that? What did Muir mean? Is there a little doorway somewhere I'm missing that I need to open up like Alice in Wonderland and move through it? Am I going to end up over in Mars or Sirius B or something? I just couldn't figure that out. 
Until one day it happened to me, the answer came with me. I was walking with my friend Stephen Mailer, and we were in Egypt at the uh, Temple of Isis uh, in, on the island of Philae over in the Aswan, and we were walking along as we always have these big conversations, and he goes, Johnny, come here, I want to show you something. That's something amazing. He takes me over to the side of this great relief at the temple that you see right here. And up there on the wall, you'll see that there is a certain relief. He said, this is what my teacher, the great Abdel Hakim Ayawan, taught him. It says that the power of the netters, and netter is also what we refer to with the gods. It's also the word that we use for nature, which uh, nature comes from the Latin natura or the Greek thesis. The power of the netters comes from the cosmic out in space. And that was profound to me because I started to realize what John Muir meant at that moment, that the clearest way into the universe is the forest wilderness. And if you look at what our astrobiologists are now teaching us, in astrobiology, they teach us that what is the forest in our world is very similar to the forest in other solar systems. We know that through the work of Rupert Sheldrake that we have an electromagnetic field around the Earth that, short, that morphs and shapes life. It has the programming language for all life on earth, that there is an interconnected synergistic aspect of this where, with our DNA, which is deoxyribonucleic acid and ribonucleic acid that communicates with proteins and amino acids and advanced instructions. It is like a receiver, okay? That's incredible. We also know through new models of our universe uh, with the plasma electric universe model that all our stars are connected through a plasmic web. So I'm here to tell you that life is everywhere in our universe, and it's abundant. Albert Einstein said, given the millions of billions of Earth-like planets, life elsewhere in the universe without a doubt does exist. In the vastness of the universe, we are not alone. So how big is our universe? Well, we know that there's more Earth-like planets than grains and sands in all our beaches, and uh, based on the Kepler space mission, that there are over 40 billion that's billion with a B, Earth-like planets in our galaxy, okay? And uh, we know that there's trillions to infinite types of galaxies in our universe. Just look at the Virgo cluster. So think about the implications, the profound implications for life. So I'm not buying that, that people say that we're the only ones out there. Man, Galileo Galilei was trying to tell you that with his, uh, out of his observatory in Civita Vecchia in 1610 with his friend Giordano Bruno. said, hey, we're not at the center of the universe. There's life everywhere in our universe. And what did they do to him? They burned him at the stake for questioning the narrative. So I wanted to find out the, the big answer. If aliens are real, how come we haven't heard from them? People always say that to me, Johnny. Why haven't we gotten a signal? So I said, well, the hell with this. I don't like waiting. I always just hop on a plane, I say, I want to get the answers myself. So I flew up to the Arecibo Observatory over in Puerto Rico. And when you go to Puerto Rico, it's a very strange place. When you rent a vehicle, it's hard as hell to drive there, first of all, because I couldn't read the signs, my GPS didn't work, and the map sucked. And, but when I finally found my way up there into the beautiful humid rainforest, where one of the largest radio telescopes in the world is, we know this is very important because Carl Sagan once sent out a message called the Arecibo Message in 1964. Uh, it was uh, beamed uh, approximately 25,000 light years away to a, star, a globular star crust, uh, cluster called M13. And there was a lot of information sent about us, including our solar system, our DNA, and uh, what kind of telescope was used. So I said to them, look, guys, I know you gotta tell everyone else the, the public answer, okay? Tell me, Tell me the truth. I'm your buddy. You can tell me. <laughs> Have we heard from aliens yet? I wanted to know. I said, there's a, you know, there's this strange crop formation in 2002 near the Chobolton Radio Telescope Observatory, and it looks like an answer came back. It looks like an alien, and it's changed. And they go, no, sir, we haven't had a reply. I was very disappointed. I mean, the weather was nice, but that was all I got out of that trip. So... What we get, when we look for answers to this, we have to ask our physicists. One of my favorite physicists in the world is Dr. Michio Kaku. I think he's absolutely brilliant. Along with him, Sheldrake and Penrose are my absolute favorites. When we talk to Kaku, he says uh, he compares advanced civilizations using something called the Kardashev scale, uh, developed by Nikola Kardashev. Uh, he says that we've only been actually searching for a sign of ETs about 100,000 light years away, which is why we haven't heard from them yet. And by the way, I don't want to confuse you guys, but our science on how far these things away are, are away in the future, how many light years they are, 
That's probably going to change very soon with Redshift, something for you to research. Um, but he says, our galaxy is only about 100,000 light years across. And galaxies are tens of millions of light years apart. So this is something for you to keep in mind, the vastness of why we haven't had this signal. Moreover, we've only been looking in one frequency so far. We've only been searching in the hydrogen frequency. Okay? The next frequency would be to search in laser. After you're done searching in laser, we'd search in broadband communication. If you think about currently the way that we are all communicating with our emails and our broadband internet, it gets broken up into little packets of information which are distributed throughout the internet. But I actually think that it's a step above that. I think that the extraterrestrials are using a quantum-based, energy-focused uh, consciousness type of communication. And I believe it works through quantum entanglement. I'll give you an example. If you were to look at this stage I'm standing on right now, and you were to look at it under a powerful enough microscope, you would see that it's in constant motion. And it's composed of uh, all these atoms, okay? So what happens when we smash an atom? We know that we see the electron whizzing around the nucleus, and a part of that you have all these little subatomic particles like quarks, neutrinos, hadrons, leptons, and gluons, etc. But that electron that's inside of that atom that's in this stage, it could be on the other side of this universe right now as we speak. And it's held together through something called quantum cohesion or superpositioning, uh, which is a part of this. So we know that it's configured like an IP address, and so are you. You have a very unique IP address, and that's very apparent. So um, if there, we're not getting the answer from our scientists, you know, who do we got to talk to? Well, these guys tried to tell us. Uh, I had the wonderful privilege of meeting the former Canadian Defense Minister of Canada, the Honorable Paul Hellyer, uh, again, over at David Whitehead's wonderful event. And uh, Paul will tell you, he'll say, yeah, ETs are real. There's extraterrestrials on our government bases working with our scientists. And the people that tell you this, they're very serious. They're not joking with you. Sergeant Clifford Stone, one of my absolute very, very favorite people in the whole world. If you're not familiar with him, look up his work. I want to bring you all back to May 9th, 2001, to the day of the Disclosure Project. There's a lot of people that are, that are sitting like you, like the press, in neatly lined up chairs, okay? This was at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And on that incredible day, there was 22 whistleblowers that were arranged, and Dr. Stephen Greer was there, our wonderful, wonderful Jordan Peace, he put this together also. We're always working behind the scenes uh, in these areas. He's done so much good. But these 22 whistleblowers were able to come forward thanks to the legal genius of the great constitutional lawyer and environmentalist himself, Daniel Sheehan, who we have the wonderful privilege of having with us today. <laughs> Absolutely incredible. He gave them the confidence to come forth and break these oaths. And I tell you, they were very eager. But I'm going to tell you a story that you probably shouldn't hear. Dr. Greer did not want Cliff Stone to come out with all the information that he did, but Cliff Stone knew he had to get this out. Sergeant Clifford Stone sat in front of this audience as these reporters with their sweaty fingers were pressed, pressing their pens against their notepads and writing at a rapacious speed trying to catch everything he was saying. He said to them, when I was in the military, when I got out, we categorized over 57 types of species. Some of them are what you would call the greys, but most of them look just like you and I. The difference is that you could walk into a room and they might be able to tell the color of an object without even looking at it. They might have a heightened sense of smell, they might have a heightened sense of taste, but they are walking amongst us and they're probably here with us today. And I'll also tell you, this is the story that we get it from Sergeant Major Bob Dean is even more profound, I tell you. He tells us, then in the summer of 1963, he was stationed at Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe for NATO. On that particular day, Bob Dean was absolutely shocked and he had his entire life transformed before his eyes. When he had been there, what happened is, is that he saw a very classified, top secret military government document that said that we've been visited for thousands of years according to military intelligence. These beings are absolutely peaceful. They don't mean any harm to us. If they wanted to take us over, they could have done so a long time ago. But that they discovered that not only were they interplanetary, intergalactic, interstellar, but even multidimensional. 
Okay, so when we start looking at these subjects, you're going to use your rationality, the faculties of the mind, your logic, your reason, your critical thinking, and I think that's great. You should do that. But I want to urge you all to become mystics. Now, what is a mystic? We know in the Greek Elusiania, which was the greatest of all the mystery schools of all of antiquity, the initiates were called the mystes. As you penetrated the inner circle, you were called the apotes. The mystic is one who sees through the mist. The mystic is one who can tap into a cosmic record, a knowing, use our dreams and intuition to bring us more information. These people knew the secrets of it. You know, Nikola Tesla said his brain was only a receiver, that he could tap into a core of information in the universe, but he didn't know how it worked. We got the likes of Rudolf Steiner. He developed anthroposophy, which was the science of the mind to enhance our agriculture sciences in every area by tapping into this field, the cosmic record of information. Uh, Walter Russell was able to teach him just about anything. All the secrets of physics and art and science all came to him. Uh, Srinvasa Ramanujan, who gave us a lot of our string theory math and advanced trigonometry complex, everything, uh, tr uh, complex uh, formulas all came to him in dreams. He had no formal training or education. And of course, none other than the great Edgar Cayce. And this is a very small list. You know, if you look over at the work of the great Grant Cameron, he has put together a book with a list of all the simultaneous inventions that have come to people at two places at once in the world, from your Isaac Newtons to your calculus formulas to inventions of the airplane, all those things. Manly Palmer Hall is one of my greatest heroes. I absolutely love this man and everything he's ever done as an esoteric historian. He said, when the human race learns to read the language of symbolism, a great veil will fall from the eyes of men. They shall then know the truth, and more than that, they shall realize that from the beginning, truth has been in the world unrecognized, save by a small but gradually increasing number appointed by the lords of dawn as ministers to the needs of human creatures struggling to regain their consciousness of divinity. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna explain why that's important, and I want you to see that when we look at our ancient history of why you have to decode these symbols. So I said, uh, again, I was telling you all how you need to become mystics. Well, I'm going to initiate everybody in this room as, as mystics today, and I'm going to give you the secret key to the mysteries to unlock them. This is Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, uh, one of the great heroes and feminists of the 19th century, an encyclopedist, an incredibly brave woman, going all throughout the ancient world, uh, looking at the ancient world mysteries, dressing up like a man, digging deeper into the mysteries. She taught there were seven keys that we needed when looking at scriptures and mythologies and ancient writings. And believe me, as a, a student of comparative religion, I'm constantly looking at these, all the different texts and pulling them apart. She said, okay, we must turn the lock seven times when we look at these. So your first key might be historical. The second key might be geographical. The third key might be astronomical or astrological, maybe theagogic, maybe religious. But I want you to keep that in mind that there are encoded scriptures and documents that we're going to start to see. One of those greatest mysteries that is connected to our ancient extraterrestrial presence on this planet is what is, what is known as the serpentine mysteries. I have to really discipline myself here to really not talk about this for a long time because this is one of my favorite subjects. I think it's one of the most profound secrets that you will ever hear. The serpentine mysteries are found throughout every culture around the world. Uh, they are probably one of the, the greatest mysteries there are. There's three types of uh, serpentine energy or electricity in our universe. The ancients called it Fohat, and it was the life force that moved through everything. In the ancient Eastern doctrines to the secret doctrines that were hidden, electricity or the serpent was said to move like this, with the pattern and formation of debris in our universe as it came together. We see this divided up into three types uh, in our world, in this energy. Uh, first of all, you might have a body-like energy of the, what's been known as Kundalini, that comes up the 33 vertebrae of the spine, uh, and it awakens out the pineal, or like you see on the headdress of the king uh, from Egypt. Uh, you also see this symbolized with the caduceus of Hermes Mercurius Trismegistus, which is our medical symbol there, as you see it moving up into the left and right hemisphere of the brain with the swan wings. So that's one type of energy. Keep that in mind, that these rulers had some sort of an advanced uh, activated body. Second of all, we have a geomagnetic energy. This geomagnetic energy is very important, and I'm going to explain that, and that's why a lot of our ancient sites and our ancient temples have been built alongside what are known as ley lines. Maybe you guys are familiar uh, when you've looked over at places like Stonehenge, 
uh, and Avebury, you'll notice that there's 900 megalithic hinges that move all the way up through the, what was formerly known as the British Isles into Napta Playa in Egypt. And it's not a coincidence, it's very significant the way that these were designed. In fact, um, these mysteries reveal that to us. The third type, we get an energy with this, this precise knowledge that our ancients knew and that has been encoded into our ancient mysteries, which is a universal energy in our universe, okay? So Nikola Tesla, when he discovered this, it was scalar energy. So after 1902, when he gave us wireless free energy and types of anti-gravitational technology, J.P. Morgan pulled the plug, okay? The Nazis tapped into it. Dr. Stephen Greer constantly talks about zero-point energy, this uh, free energy that would challenge the fossil fuel industry. This is the highest level of energy and technology that our militaries have, and basically this, this, is, a, this is still used today, and it's still a science that's understood. Over here on the top that you might notice of my slide, I took this picture, and uh, this was taken in Egypt at uh, Hattur's temple in Dendara. It's one of my favorite temples. And you'll see that there's the serpent rulers over Earth. They, they were the winged serpent rulers. They understood the serpentine energy. These winged serpent rulers were referred to in the Bible as the seraphim, the winged serpents that came about this way. Uh, even to the Druids, the Druids had a serpent god known as Hugh or Hugh Gadarn, and uh, that's where you get the word Hugh man from. So this serpent energy is entwined in everything we do there. We see that this has been encoded into our ancient mysteries, has been what's known as the serpentine migration path. A lot of our uh, very big megalithic sites in the world, even if you look at the Great Pyramid or you go into Somerset, you look at Glastonbury Tor, we see that they've been put along the 33rd parallel. In the Bible, there's a very curious verse. It says in the book of Genesis, Dan shall judge his people by the tribes of Israel, and it says that they moved along the serpent's path with the adder at their feet. Now, it's very interesting because when you look at who the serpent rulers were in our ancient world, if you look at Egypt, you have the serpent. You go to the Oracle of Delphi, you have the Hydra. You go over into the Yucatan in Mexico, you have Quetzalcoatl or Kukulikan. You go over into Peru, and we find that there's two gods. We have the Viracocha, which are the energy ley lines and paths on the earth that they were all formed in this certain way. But you also have Amaru, their god, which America is named after, Amaruka, land of the plume serpent. So there's no doubt been a magnificent type of technology and energy on this planet and understanding on how to use it, which, as I will show you, could potentially be tapped into for all types of regeneration of the body, perhaps even for UFOs and so much more. But when we look at cosmology and say, where do we all come from? A lot of people want to look at our religions and the Bible. And they want to say, well, is there a story about where we come from and why our visitors would come here? And does the Bible and, and these various books, do they show us, you know, uh, do they show us how the universe was created? Well, this is something I've had many great conversations with my friend Jordan Maxwell about and uh, rabbis over from Tel Aviv and others. We know that the book of Genesis in the Bible comes from a much... Uh, larger Babylonian tale known as the Enuma Lish. Uh, and when you read the first part of Genesis, we know that there's been several errors in there. There were several mistakes made by the king's translators uh, who were put there by King James the uh, Sixth. Uh, actually, it was King James the Sixth became King James the First by his overseer, the great Sir Francis Bacon. So at the beginning of the Bible, when it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, it actually should be the Elohim. And the Elohim is a plural, okay, all the way through there. Second of all, the Bible does not say that the, the earth was created. It says it was being recreated, and that's the other mistake we have. Um, and so there's another various curious verse we find there, and it talks about in the beginning that everything was without form or void. And we get a little error in our translation. There's a mistake there because of a word that was used. And this is a very important word. That word is tohu wabohu. And this slide didn't translate properly, so behind that, that word is actually hiding. Um, so what we have to do to find out the answers of this, we have to pick up Dr. Bullinger's study Bible, the companion Bible, and see where else do we find in the Bible that that word was being used. And it says that word was being used in Jeremiah 4.23. Now here's a fun story for you guys from the book of Jeremiah in the Bible for all my uh, comparative religious researcher friends out here. <laughs> so... In the book of Jeremiah, we get a story where Jeremiah is floating above the earth. How did he get above the earth? First of all, who took him up there? And uh, as he's going, he's looking down at the earth, and he sees that the earth 
uh, has been destroyed. The cities on earth had become tohu abohu. Now, these cities on the earth that had become destroyed, it says they weren't built by man. So if man never built the cities on the earth, who built those cities? I want you to ask yourself that. The gods. Uh, thirdly, we can clearly see that this term does not mean uh, that it was void and without form. It means waste and desolation or destruction. So here we have a story of recreation, an Elohim group that comes in and they want to save the day. In the beginning of the Bible, we start to get other clues uh, about where we come from and who we were and who were these beings that were involved in our matters, okay? You know it says that they said, let's make man in our image. Well, that means man was already there. We were getting an upgrade, as these stories tell us. And actually, if you go look into the Hebrew and the other translations, Adam was never one person. Eve was never one person. It was ADM, which was a race of people, which is very interesting. And as you go further into the Jewish Midrash, they have another interesting story in the Jewish Midrash that actually says that we came from an androgynine being, which is just like that picture you see there with a male facing one way, female facing the other way, split down the middle, and apparently that's how it all came together. But if you go further into such tales from the Epic of Gilgamesh, we know that there was a story of how the gods came here and took the wild man, upgraded us, and we had other upgrades by commingling after uh, well, there's a story about a divine prostitute in Ishtar, but I won't go into that. Um, but anyhow, the idea here is that we're all a hybrid species. Everybody in this room, we're all a hybrid species. Uh, we've all had a bit of a genetic upgrade through this work. And for some reason, the gods seem to be involved in this in all the ancient legends, whether it's Assyrians, Akkadians, Phoenician, Canaanites, Tr Etruscans, everywhere we go, we have that involvement. Now, here's one of my favorite extraterrestrial stories from mythology. This is a, this is a fun story. So if you go back into the beginning of uh, Greek mythology, and uh, you go back, this is about 4,000 years ago, we get a story of a man named Hesiod. So Hesiod was a goat herder. He was minding his own business. And one day, you know, he's, he's out there with his goats, probably not smelling all that great. And all of a sudden in the distance, these gorgeous, beautiful women floating off the ground start coming towards him. And they're just moving towards him in this amazing, mystical way that he's mesmerized by them. And they say, Hesiod, stop what you're doing. We have something important to tell you. And they say, uh, did you know, first of all, do you know who we are? He goes, no, I don't. They say, we are the muses. Now, the word muse is where you get museum, amusing, and uh, muse, uh, musing. And museum, if you look, go into Europe, if you look at what your ticket will say, if you go to the Vatican, it will say muse, because that's where we get these, uh, these are the, the sources of information and knowledge that came to the earth. They said, we want to tell you how this works on earth. Did you know that you are ruled over by the gods? And the gods that rule over the earth, they uh, actually rule up from Jupiter with Zeus, the ruler of Cassiopeia, and they control the affairs of earth. Did you know that there are basically infinite other planets that are ruled over by other intelligence and visitors, and they start to dictate to them how it works. They say, in fact, we can tell you how this works so well that the gods can actually drop an anvil from their balcony and land on the earth, and this is where it will go, uh, which I think is absolutely amazing that here we have an extraterrestrial story. And by the way, this is a uh, picture, an unflattering picture I took of myself uh, here next to the muses at a sarcophagus at the um, and a Museum of Archaeology over in Ephesus in Turkey near Kushidasi. So, if there are ETs in the ancient world, how are they getting here? Well, go, let's go look at the idea of ancient flying machines, otherwise known as Vimanas, okay? So, th these are kind of known by different things as the Palace of the King, uh, you know, they're known as flying chariots, uh, today they're known as flying machines, and actually, probably one of the greatest truthful things ever written about this was by UFO's greatest historian of all times, the great Richard Dolan that's sitting here. He wrote in the uh, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind, which has my favorite cover. I hear he's going to change it. I wasn't happy about that. A Monty Python cover. But he wrote on chapter 2, page 48, paragraph 2, he wrote that Bimanas, much of what we know about them on the internet, has been recycled again and again. And it's true. Everybody just recycles the same thing. And there is a lot of mistranslations and a lot of nonsense out there. But it's quite simply put that if we look into the Indian text, going back into the Ramayana, which is the great epic tale of India, in the Mahabharata, which has a summation of that, 18 books over 100,000 words, something like that, and in the Samarangana Sutradhara, 
we find the description of these flying machines, epic conquests and battles. It's absolutely incredible. In Roman records, we find the records of uh, Pliny the Elder talking about the Romans witnessing flying shields. My goodness, that's so incredible. Uh, we also find, unfortunately, that we can't really find remains of Vimanas to this day, even though they've been described quite beautifully. Uh, but I would say that the other night I was talking to George Norrie on Coast to Coast, and he said, Johnny, what if they just flew off? And I said, yeah, that's a pretty good explanation. That could be true. Uh, but also, you know, what about the idea that David Hatcher Childress brings forth? That gold can be preserved forever, but if these crafts were made of metal, they would erode after 200 years, which I think is a very good point to make. Now, UFOs and ancient Buddhism. Believe me, I have to control myself here because there's so much I'd like to say. I could do two hours on this. Um, in ancient India, right around the time of the common era, the Christian era, there was a type of mystical Buddhism known as Mahayana Buddhism. Okay, so there were, actually all of our religions had mystical origins, to be honest with you. But at the time, Hinduism was spreading. Uh, and there, they had to flee. The secrets had to flee. There, we see very clearly in depictions that the bodhisattvas were able to fly, use, fly up into the heavens using these things called pagodas, which would make sense being in the home of India, the time, uh, in the place of Vimanas. Okay? Uh, but when they had to flee, they had to flee with the secrets of stuff like using sound to levitate things, the esoteric secrets of, of meditation, uh, these sort of secrets. And this is, this, is, this is why we see a very interesting spread of the types of Buddhism, more conservative Buddha, Buddhism you find over in China, Myanmar, um, Burma, even in Korea, different places like that. All the secrets of Buddhism fled up into Tibet, into the Himalayan areas with the Arhats as they fleed with these secrets. But we know that there is reminiscent uh, types of texts about that. Maybe you guys have seen this guy before. Okay, the story, if we go back into Zoroastrianism, we hear about Zarathustra. Zarathustra encountered the creator god of the universe who is known as Ahura Mazda. And you know what? The Ahura Mazda coming down a flying disc, you might think of him more when I show you this. When you're in traffic and you see that Mazda symbol now, remember who told you it. Okay? Um, now this is very interesting. Um, this is a, my friend Muhammad Ibrahim, he's an Egyptologist. Uh, he's made this example. I'm doing another tour into Egypt with him. Very exclusive permissions. We'll show you stuff. You just have blow your mind, I promise you, if you come with us. Um, he and I have had many conversations about this. This is the famous helicopter glyph that you see over in Abydos in Egypt. Everybody trips out on this, and they're like, oh my God, I see a helicopter, I see submarines, I see airplanes. I see it too, okay? I got there, and I was the biggest believer. I was like, oh my God, I see it, I see it, I want to believe. And I still think there might be something to it. But actually, what we learn is that it's actually a palimpsest. This is a phenomena in archaeology where erosion's been there and other glyphs have been written on top of it. Very quickly in Egypt, we find the, the flying bird of Saqqara in 1898 that was discovered. Saqqara is where we get the word sacred. Um, and basically, it looks like a full-on glider with the tail and everything. When you look at it, it's absolutely amazing that something so old could be there. We have the reference of the bird man in Abydos, which shows that they were attempting flight kind of like the complete man when we look over at Leonardo da Vinci and all those sort of, uh, sorts of depictions. Very quickly, in the Bible, we have a very, very clear encounter of Ezekiel with the cylinders within cylinders that come down from the heavens as he's out there, absolutely mystified as these cylinders within cylinders with sparkling, shining rims with thousands of blinking eyes. Eyes? Sounds like lights. Primitive people trying to describe that. Absolutely amazing. So I've tried to find, where, do we, where did all this technology go? Where did it disappear to? Well, we know that we, civilizations have been like onions, layers of the onion that we have to peel back. Going back into uh, Plato's Atlantis story relayed by Solon when he met with Sanchis of Saïs in Egypt. He said, silly Greeks, you are like children to me. There's been so many civilizations. You just have one flood story that you know of, but there have been many. Uh, we know that uh, there was something probably known as the Younger Dryas Cataclysm about 12,000 years ago, along with various solar storms that wiped out and decimated most of our planet, causing a mini ice age as we go back from something known as the Pleistocene period. After that, we went into the Holocene up until now. This caused the Earth to go like this at 23 degrees and shift this way. So think about what was at the North Pole and the South Pole. Think about the migrations of what would have been there. Uh, we know that in all of our ancient legends of what came down for the mysteries came down out of the far north, okay? 
Uh, and if you go look on, you'll, you can find evidence of this with Emmanuel Velikloski and others looking at it, that you'll find tropical flash flora and fauna and mammals up at the Arctic Circle and whatnot. We knew that there was a very advanced group, when we connect this to the Vimanas and everything else, and to the Aryans, that they came down into the Indo-Gangenic plains of the Indo-Ganges and mixed with the Dravidian peoples, which became India. This is where we get the deposit of all these great and fascinating stories. They spread into Asia Minor, then later into Northern Africa with Egypt. And as these things started to progress after the last ice age, we had a very interesting group, highly developed. And this is where we get these stories of technologies and more. So who were they? Do we have evidence that they were significant? Some people have hypothesized that the, these stories could be connected to angels. Okay, now this is a very interesting topic. Again, with this idea of angels and demons and uh, people who, there's been lots of great uh, scholars and uh, Christian researchers out there like your L.A. Marzulis and the late Chuck Misslers. Uh, we get the Tom Horns looking at this. But they, a lot of them will say, okay, all ETs are just demons impersonating them. That's all they are. I think that's a little pragmatic and geocentric myself. For me, uh, my theory goes that maybe at times we have mistaken some of our visitors as being spiritual beings due to their highly evolved capabilities and technology. I'm willing to open up to some ideas that maybe a good angel uh, might be an ET and maybe a bad one might be what we call a demon, but, uh, you know, that's how I look at it. So in the Bible, it actually says in the book of Hebrews, it says, do not forget to show hospitality to strangers, for by doing so, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. In the book of Watchers, which is connected to the book of Enoch, the Watchers 6 and 7 said that there had been fallen angels that actually landed to the earth, dated and laid with the daughters of man, and produced unto them an offspring of giants, and had taught them all sorts of uh, you know, secrets about agriculture had taught them so many things about, you know, basically civilization and technology. But the point is, is that we're told these were angels that came down from the heavens and landed with us. Uh, in the Bible, it very clearly says that sometimes they were so tall that we looked like grasshoppers to them. So who could these people be? Who could these ancient, ancient rulers over humanity be? The giants. Well, we know when we look at the gods of Egypt, we have a very curious lineup. According to Plutarch, the gods of ancient Egypt were actually the antediluvian kings, which means the pre-flood, the pre-cataclysmic kings who were deified or made into gods after death. So who were they? Actually, it's very interesting when we start to look at one of the greatest progenitors in Egypt, it is uh, none other than Osiris. Osiris is a god with an elongated head who's also a giant. It's very interesting that I've found evidence for giants in many different places, which is fascinating, that corresponds with this idea that we get from the biblical text. Uh, this is my friend uh, Yusuf Iowan, a picture taken by Erica Marmus, standing next to one of the giant sarcophagi in the museum at Cairo, uh, next to a 15 to 25 foot sarcophagi, which is fascinating. You see this? For no reason, enormous coffin, it says. Oh, geez, I don't know what that would be doing there. When you ask them where the bodies are, they just shrug their shoulders and tell you they don't know. Probably in the basement. Uh, <laughs> over here, we see the, this is in, under the crypts of uh, Hattur's temple in Dendara. We see the famous light bulb glyph. You might notice again the serpentine energy being given to us by who? The giants. And actually, uh, there's a story I don't have time to go into that goes from 1001 Nights, comes from the Arabian Nights about the giants that had built and hid the pyramids, uh, secrets under the pyramids, uh, according to the Caliph al-Mamun. So over here again, we have the idea that we've had rulers with elongated skulls and giants seeding humanity after great cataclysms. We have the story of Dagon or Oannes. Uh, some call them Nimrod, some call them Sidon for teaching us agriculture. We have Osiris. It's interesting because I did have a picture here. I don't know what happened to it. I did have a picture there of the King Akhenaten, and Akhenaten was a very famous story in Egypt that we have. He was a rebel king that led people out of Thebes into Armana. Uh, but of course, uh, with that, uh, he's depicted in the Cairo Museum as both him and all his family as having elongated skulls. And people have often said, well, all the rulers in Egypt must have had elongated skulls. I disagree with that. We know that actually his father, Amenhotep III, had quite a regular skull. Uh, and also his son, Tutankhamun, had a regular skull. Uh, and this is his depiction, his bust, his actual bust in Berlin, uh, that we know he looks quite normal. So truth be told, uh, when we look at this, 
these uh, people around the, world, around the world wanted to mimic these elongated skull rulers because they were like a divine race of advanced beings that were overseeing us and they were very highly involved in our mysteries. Here's my friend Brian Forrester, uh, and he has looked at this very closely. Actually, he and I are also doing a tour uh, next year to Peru and Bolivia and uh, Punapunku. We're looking at the Serpentine Mysteries. He has spent a lot of time absolutely fascinated with these skulls, examining them for evidence. And recently, he made the most incredible evidence that just blew this case right open. What he discovered, uh, after petitioning this work in the government and working with officials for so long, uh, he got L.A. Marzulli to fly down there. Marzulli was very interested in this. Marzulli put together $100,000 U.S. to actually go and get some DNA testing on this. Uh, and what they found, these, there was a particular cache of these skulls over in Paracas, where we find out that they are 25% larger and 60% heavier than conventional human skulls, and the spine sits in a different way to support their weight. Um, we're also told that these are related to skulls that have been found in the Caspian Sea, the Northern Black Sea, Crimea, and the Scandinavian areas. Uh, they would have had reddish to light hair, and they would have been from the haplogroup UTE1. And what's really interesting about this is that this challenges our academia in every way because Native Americans that were taught, thought to cross the Bering Land Strait, or the Bering Land Bridge, only would have been from haplogroups A, B, C, D, and X. So this challenges academia on every, on every front, and it shows us that these were declared a new subspecies of, of human known as Homo sapiens sapiens paracus. So here we have these elongated rulers, the gods, with all these magnificent abilities that have been uh, linked into this. Now, I've looked, uh, I've looked at this topic uh, uh, very, very in depth and interviewed all kinds of ET contactees and whistleblowers and people like this, uh, but I want to bring up someone who's in the audience with us today, uh, Derek White Sky Cloud there in the back. His story is uh, just amazing. If you've never heard it, make sure you harass him after and ask him all about it, <laughs> find him. But uh, he is a gifted seer. He's an elder in our Métis community, and I've talked to him about our First Nations and our indigenous people and their experiences. Uh, and he's revealed to me not only do we have these practices of working with the star beings, uh, as well as Tom McCallum here who has the uh, sacred dances that they use to contact them. It's been a very much a part of their culture. But Derek is a, has been a contactee for many years. In 2002, he had an incredible experience taken up uh, onto a ship to meet a being named Z known as Zael, who was about eight feet tall, with light features and light eyes. They brought him up on a ship, whizzing past the star, us out or through Orion's belt, and they told him the story behind the history of our solar system and our planet. And they instilled within him the idea that what he needs to do is to bring forth a message of environmentalism and environmentalism, a uh, uh, message of hope for us. We also see that in other Native American cultures, and even here, uh, there's been descriptions of flying canoes. We have that even in uh, Quebec, which is very similar to the story that we hear from Ezekiel with the blinking eyes. Uh, Native American peoples have had petroglyphs when we look at the Zuni and the Hopi depicting ET visitors and giants. Now, now this is one of my favorite ET contact ET stories in the world. I'm gonna try to give it to you as quickly as I possibly can. This is my dear, dear friend uh, and teacher, and I spent a lot of time with him, Jordan Maxwell, and I wanna pay tribute to him tonight also. Uh, because he's been doing this work for over 59 years, and without him, this genre wouldn't have, you know, anything to go by with all the secret societies and hidden symbolism. Uh, please check out his website for more information on his stories. Okay, um, this story, it starts back in 1959. We go back to 1959 in Pensacola, Florida. He's leaving his family's home, and he hops on a bus, and he wants to go to Los Angeles. He doesn't know why, but he wants to go to Los Angeles very badly. So he arrives on this bus in Los Angeles, out of there, and he looks around and he says, I don't think I want to stay here. This place doesn't look too good to me. So he asks the bus driver, where do people sleep around here? He says, well, go to North Hollywood. That seems like a nice place to live. So as he hops over to North Hollywood, he's kind of wandering around, broken penniless. He gets a job right away and gets an advance on some money, uh, gets a little place. As soon as he's settled in, he meets this girlfriend. He meets a... And this is why we call this the E.T. girlfriend story. It's a very interesting story. I always ask him to tell me it. Uh, and I want you all to go back with me for a moment, back to that, you know, in the Back to the Future movie, where they're, uh, you know, Biff Tannen and Marty McFly, and they have the, the, the milkshakes and the diners. Well, this is at a place called Bob's Diner. He's sitting down there. He meets this girl. He's 19. She's 17. And they start talking. But she says to him, Jordan, I want you to meet my father. 
Now, I don't know any self-respecting guy in here today that gets really excited when your girlfriend says, I want you to meet my father. It doesn't really usually go over too well. So anyhow, he reluctantly agrees. And he says, okay, I'll meet your father. As soon as he goes up to the doorstep of where the father is, immediately he could tell that there was something different about this man. His movements were almost inhuman, and everything that he did was absolutely perfect. He welcomed him in the house, and he said, why don't you have a sit down on that couch over there? How are you liking Los Angeles, Jordan? Well, it's, it's okay. I like it. Oh, that's good. And then he, all of a sudden, he just throws this out there. Do you remember the time when you were eight years old? And you got up in the middle of the night because you were thirsty and you wanted a drink of water. So you went out to the back porch where your dad had just built a new porch out of green lumber and it smelled funny. He takes a long pause. Gulp. Yes, I remember that time. Do you remember you went out and you sat down on the porch and you took off a little piece of wood. You put it in between your teeth. And you looked up to the moon that night, to the heavens, to God. And you said, I want to do something important with my life. And he says... I remember. He goes, well, we heard you. That was us. We brought you here. And we brought you to Los Angeles. It's not a coincidence that you're here. You're going to do something very important with your life, but it's not going to happen towards the end of your life. Then they pulled a book down off the shelf. The book was called The Complete Works of Charles Fort. As he pulled this book down and opened it up, it was almost to the exact perfect page of something that captured his interest and drew him right into this. It was absolutely amazing. Then he said to him, you know what, I'm going to give you this book and your work is going to start, but the most important thing you're going to do isn't going to start to the end of your life, but we're going to prepare you for something right now. So he says, would you like to see some UFOs? He goes, boy, would I ever. That would be fantastic. And sorry, guys, I'm almost done. I'm wrapping up. Last couple minutes. Would you like to see some UFOs? Of course, I'd like to see some UFOs. He takes him out to the backyard, and all of a sudden, he starts inaudibly calling these UFOs with his mouth. He goes, just a second, they'll be here. They'll be here, okay? He's sitting out there with the girlfriend and all of them. All of a sudden, these gorgeous UFOs appear across the backyard, up into the sky with laser-like colors, totally mesmerizing in every aspect. And as he sees them, this startled him and changed him. It was the most beautiful thing he had ever witnessed in his life. And he said, those are ours, the dad says casually to him. In the weeks that followed, uh, he would take Jordan out to all kinds of places. He'd take him out uh, to the back of Palmdale, out in the desert, and say, look, there's UFO bases under the earth. I can only take you so far. There's an extraterrestrial presence in every aspect of our society, but we were brought here to tell you about this. And actually, these kind of encounters in the 1950s were very common. Uh, one of the greatest collections that's been put together by about them was actually probably out of the work of Albert Rosales published by his publisher, uh, Ash Staunton. They've had the Humanoid Encounter series. It's absolutely fascinating. I love the 1950s stories. So, wrapping up today, I want to tell you that, guys this. This is my last message for you. Knowledge is useless without wisdom. I don't want you to come here today and just think this was infotainment, okay? These aren't just a bunch of really cool facts that are there to entertain you. They're not just for fun. I know it's very interesting sitting there. I want you to think deeply about them. I want you to think deeply about what all the presenters are telling you because everybody has a piece of the cosmic puzzle. This information should teach us to be more loving, to be more kind, to take greater self-responsibility, to start being the great caretakers of our planet. If we want to become the great citizens of the universe, first of all, we have to become citizens of the world, okay? And this is what I believe it means to be architects of the new paradigm. I want to say thank you all so much for your time today. Uh, it's been a wonderful privilege to speak to you all. And if you are interested in coming with me to see these mysteries, I promise you it's not just slides. I will take you down into the bottom of temples. I'll show you elongated skulls. I'll show you things that will blow your mind. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. The question is, where are you going to go? To what university would you ever possibly consider going and spending a day, a week, a month, even a year to get this kind of information? And how much would you pay? You know, I mean, this is just amazing. It really speaks to the quality of our, of our speakers and the way uh, Jordan has put the conference together. It's the true learning experience that gets inside of you. And to some point, <laughs> if it happens to me, it happens to a lot of people, you're, you get a flip of a switch. And all of a sudden, you get to realize 
boy, this is really something. And I'll, let me just share something with you before you go to lunch. At the Alien Cosmic Expo last weekend in Toronto, we had three days, and um, the phenomenon that I found was at the beginning of the conference, I was I did a presentation and I, and so, some of the speakers, but I found that when I began the whole thing, I, I didn't sense anything from you guys, from the people that were there. So at some point I said, is there anybody out there? You know, it's the feeling that I had. But as the days progressed, I could feel the energy building in the room, and I'm getting the same sense right now. I'm just, I'm kind of feeling you emote in a way that you didn't emote this morning. And I think that's a result of a, hearing this information and the effect it is having on each of us psychically. And, and I get to a level of consciousness that really moves you to understand that. And that feeling is not easy to achieve. And I think that's the kind of thing that you won't get at a university, but you'll get it here. Lunch is at one o'clock. Try to get back maybe five minutes before if you can. That way at one o'clock. Okay, thank you.